I am not gonna be able to sleep after this, am I? Come close. A little bit closer. Let me tell you guys a secret. I love thrillers. I love consuming thriller mysteries in all sorts of media, whether it's TV, the big screen, or on books. I buy more than enough thrillers and mysteries, and yet I don't read them that often, which is why I thought it would be a great idea to handpick a few thrillers that I already own or that I'm super excited to read and share my thoughts with you guys as I go and just see what comes of this because Coincidentally enough, a lot of my anticipated releases for this year were thrillers, and I didn't realize that up until I was already filming my 2022 anticipated releases list, and yet I have not read a single one. We're gonna do that in this video. And we're gonna be starting out with The House Across the Lake. So let me tell you, I started The House Across the Lake and this is actually really good. I was really scared because I hadn't seen the best of things going into this, but in my head, I just told myself, I didn't enjoy Survive the Night. This can't be two for two, like back to back bad releases. This one has to be good. I'm enjoying every second of this. I'm currently on page 183. So I'm about to start a section in the before. The two prevalent sections timeline wise in this book are the now and the before. Now we follow our main character whose name is Casey and she has arrived at her lake house and she has done so in order to escape the real world and the tabloids because she does have problems with alcohol and it's starting to bleed into the media and her mom in order to protect her told her to just hide out in the lake house to solve this massive issue in her life and hopefully by the time that she comes back everything will be righted which is so much easier said than done because addiction is not something that you can just deal with on your own especially when there are people in your life as Casey has that are enabling that behavior so it's just difficult all around however the plot thickens when Casey gets there and she develops this obsession with the couple that lives across the lake and she starts observing them from afar she has a pair of binoculars and she just watches them every day every night she does so very quietly up until a mystery happens and she takes it upon herself to solve it and that's when things get really messy you really have no idea what's happening and I feel like the plot twist in this is gonna be like really Really, really crazy and I am super excited. I also love all of the talk about the media, being an actress, all that that entails and just being in the public eye and how isolating it is despite being so in the public eye and that is something that Casey can relate to very heavily with Catherine which is the person who lives across the lake with her husband because Catherine used to be a supermodel. She was also super famous. And I love honestly how Riley Sager has navigated those conversations about being a public figure and all of the stressors and all of the pressures of that. It's almost like one of those addicting reads that once you start, you don't want to stop up until you finish it. And I will say that about Riley Sager's writing is that it's incredibly accessible and you really just don't want to stop. And so I feel for people who are either like going through a reading slump or you're finding difficulty getting through a book, something like this could break that cycle. I just want to throw this out there because, <clears throat> wait, Detective Mel is on the case. Uh, I have theories. <laughs> this is literally something from my lamp. We know right from the start of the book that her husband has died. And I'm like, did she murder the husband? First theory, putting it out there. And then my other thing, because there has been talk of like ghosts and spirits, particularly like spirits trapped in lakes. And I'm like, is Catherine dead? And Casey is seeing Catherine's ghost. Maybe, but then everybody around her. It's like, yes, Catherine's. Like, everybody acknowledges Catherine's presence. I don't feel like that could be possible. Detective Mitt is on the case. Y'all need to see this. Look at this cuteness. Look at this beautiful lady. <laughs> the house across the lake and this was very good i gave it four stars it was very camp so if you're looking to get into this book don't expect anything incredibly fleshed out maybe don't even expect something that is fully foreshadowed like i do think parts of what end up happening are sort of hinted at in the story but there are parts of it that as an overall twist did come out of nowhere i think as far as thrillers go not the best one but definitely up there in terms of enjoyment if you're looking 
for a thriller to read for the shits and giggles, something that reads super easily. I think this is something that you could enjoy. Genuinely speaking, if you like sort of the comedic, campy vibes of my best friend's exorcism, I feel like this is something that you could enjoy. So yes, this was good. It had me hooked and the twists were great. And that being said, we are walking into the second book for the reading vlog, which is The Id Girl by Ruth Ware. I did start this last night. I haven't read a lot of it, by the way. I literally read 10 pages of this, but it was a good start. I like that when stories are originated in college, but the prevalent storyline we get in the book is present time, or at least it seems like that's what this book is gonna do. I love when it starts out with the I should have known. I should have known that this, this, and that based on this, this, and this. And to this day, I will never forgive myself for not recognizing the signs or something along those lines. I love that start. I feel it's very cinematic in terms of opening. So I'm about to sit down and read. I've got my coffee. I'm about to turn on an ambience room and it's gonna be amazing. Well, hopefully, because I don't know if the book is gonna be amazing, but at least the ambience will be amazing. <laughs> Hello, I just took my nighttime shower and I have read a lot of the id girl I didn't expect myself to read this book as fast as I am if anything I thought this was going to be the book I read the slowest in this video and yet I read 52% today and I'm about to sit down with dinner and read the other 48% of this I am surprised at how easy it is to read and connect to because my other experience with Ruth Ware was one by one and it was not the best experience and also this book is so long for a thriller I was genuinely scared and although the book is very slow in its space I find that I don't mind it because it allows me for more time to connect with the characters with the plot line and it continues to build that intrigue I wouldn't say the book is too tense but there's definitely this sense of intrigue to find out exactly what happened to the character in question in here whose name is April so as far as what this book is about we follow Hannah and April who are best friends. They met at Oxford in their first year of college and they fastly became friends. They were roommates and they quickly built this friend group together and they were all very entangled with each other. People liking each other, dating each other, having sex and just doing all the things. And one person is convicted for the murder. This said person goes to jail. And now many years later, the conviction is put into question as people doubt that the person who was convicted was actually guilty of murdering April. And this book is set up in a way that we get to explore our current timeline, present time, and we get to see Hannah find all of this information out and really dive into this deep, dark wormhole of did this person really not kill April? If it was not this person, then who was it? Because I don't remember anything about this night except finding her body. And then we have flashbacks to the past in college, so we alternate timelines. That being said, do I wish this book was slightly shorter? Absolutely. I feel like at the point where I'm at, I should start finding out some answers and I am not yet there. So we'll see where that takes us. Hopefully there'll be some good twists because I need this to get exciting because although I'm not minding the pace of it, I need more because it's been pretty much a bunch of the same. <laughs> Hi, so I finished the id girl and I'm currently propping you up on the book, but I finished it last night It is currently 9 25 on a Wednesday and I think I'm giving it three stars Honestly, I think the setup was fantastic And then the second half fell apart for me Which I think is really interesting because honestly I wouldn't be surprised if people enjoyed the second half more than the first one only because it's more exciting It's more investigative. However, I liked the intrigue of the first part and the setup in college a lot more and the second part just continued to fall apart for me from the twists to the explanations to how things kept developing it was just all very underwhelming for me especially for such a long book I was expecting like this huge massive crazy twisted super messed up twist and yet none of that happened I feel she had so many great opportunities and by she I mean Ruth Ware I feel like she had so many amazing opportunities 
space to do something really wild and she didn't and so for such a long book it almost feels like I got nothing in return so that was extremely disappointing in terms of an ending however I will say I did like the character construction I think it was really great to have a set of best friends who one of them Hannah comes from a middle-class background and she really fought her way into Oxford and then somebody like April who was super privileged and super wealthy and although she earned her place in Oxford as well she was somebody who was constantly using her money to her advantage and somebody who because she grew up in a space of privilege it warped her personality in a way that she felt entitled to things entitled to people she felt like she deserved things and she always wanted things to go her way which I think ultimately made for such an interesting character and especially her being the person who was murdered in this book it sort of makes you question everybody because it seems like everybody has a motive to have committed that murder. However, I really do think just given how long this book was, there were things that could have been built differently and written differently in a way that foreshadowed things better, in a way that made you question everybody just a little bit better because it definitely leaned towards questioning certain individuals more than others. And although that's not a bad thing because red herrings and all, I just think it could have been done better structurally, especially again because of how long the book is. And so I think my biggest gripe with this is how little it did for such a long story. And that's kind of where I fall. So yes, that's it on the id girl and I don't know what I'm gonna pick up next. So let's go pick something out. <laughs> world does this book start with my biggest fear? We start out the book in a prologue with Ben, who is our main character Jess's half-brother, and he is living, laughing. Well, actually, I don't know if he's laughing or loving, but at least he is living. He is doing his thing, and then suddenly he hears something from outside his door. He stands in front of his door, and then he sees somebody turn the fucking key and open his door to break in. That is literally my worst nightmare and you want to know what the worst thing is? It's happened to me before. And mind you, every time it's been accidental, but that doesn't stop it from being scary as all hell. So you know, gotta hate that the book starts with my biggest fear, but also, I will say, was not expecting to have the POV of people who also live in this building. And I love that. I love that immediately we get Ben's POV and then we get Jess's POV. And then we also get to see other people in the building and their lives, but also them having somewhat of a motive to attack and kill Ben potentially because they're all claiming that everything was great and dandy. This is like a super wealthy building, by the way, until Ben arrived. And it's setting up the intrigue. It's setting up the thriller vibes and it is setting up Motive, and I am into it. struggling through the Paris apartment. I didn't think I was gonna struggle through this one because it started out really, really well for me. And unfortunately, I'm struggling. I'm 50% through. And this is definitely one of those books that I think the first 15% is super interesting. And then the more we dive into the book, it just seems so long-winded for what it is. And I do appreciate certain parts of the structure. I appreciate the clue-like format to this where we have a big cast of characters and everybody knows a piece of information that they're not giving up. And therefore, everybody is a suspect because they all have something to hide regarding the disappearance because we don't really know if Ben has been murdered. And I appreciate the fact that the chapters are super, super short. So that part I really do enjoy. But beyond that, I find that this book is not really that good. So the main premise of this is our main character, Jess, arriving to Paris because she is running away from something that happened back in the UK, which is where she is from. And she comes to Paris to stay with her brother, Ben. Lo and behold, when she gets there, Ben is gone. She had called him, she had texted him, he is nowhere to be found. And everybody in this building 
clothing seems just a little too suspicious for anybody's liking. They seem to know things about Ben that Jess doesn't know, and they all seem to think that the dynamics of the building and everybody knowing each other were massively impacted and or changed once Ben moved into this building. But beyond that, we're not really getting anything of value, and I need this to be over. I need to find out what happens, and I need to call this a day. I also find that this book is sort of falling into the stereotype of the French are rude and disrespectful and super unwelcoming. In my experience, I've never experienced that with anybody who's French, and so I really dislike the stereotype that this book is falling into. It's very Emily in Paris where everything's in English, and then you've got the occasional French phrase, and you've got them being just very standoffish to our main character, Jess. And so that part I'm not really loving, and it's doing it quite a lot, quite frequently. Which brings me to my next point. Everything is so scattered and the chapters are so short, which I am enjoying, but I think it's also working to the book's detriment because it's not really allowing for a lot of dots to come together as you read the story, or at least not to me. And the only real theory I have, which is barely even a theory to begin with more than it is sort of a statement, is that Nick has got to in some way be involved with Ben's disappearance. His POV, I think, is the most obvious in regards to his resentment of Ben, and also a big event happening that impacted the relationship, their friendship, in a really bad way. And so I wouldn't be surprised if this man is jelly jelly in some way, shape, or form, and he did something to Mr. Ben. Also, it's said that Ben was working on this piece about some riots and something that's very political, and that has in some way, shape, or form got to factor into why he's disappeared or been murdered in the first place, and I cannot imagine that Nick would not be involved in that, especially because Miss Jess is very much into this man and she's like, oh my god, he's so cute, he's so hot. And I'm like, and that's exactly the person who's gonna end up being in some way involved. <laughs> I am so sorry, but this is just... <laughs> it feels like Lucy Foley wrote five different books. She just put them all together and then she just expected it all to mesh at some point in the story. And it didn't quite fit, I think, in the way she was expecting it to. And so ultimately this book just made for a very unpleasant reading experience the more it kept going. I think it had a lot of interesting elements to it, particularly with the final reveal right before the end. I think that plot twist was so good if only it had been done correctly, if only it had been better set up and even the motif behind it and the reasoning why everybody was okay with this one thing occurring, I would have loved to see exactly why that was. Overall, it ended up being a hot mess. It had a good setup and I think a good twist at the end, but a book cannot be as good as its twist. A book cannot only be as good as its ending. Everything else has to fit. Everything else surrounding that twist has to be good. And this book did not have anything going for it beside a good start and a good twist. All of the characters end up sounding the exact same where you don't even know what POV you are reading from because they all have the same mannerisms, the same way of speaking. The only thing that's different, obviously, is their introspection because they're all going through different things and they're all connected to Ben in different ways, but they all sound the freaking same so you don't really know who you're reading from. This was frustrating because I started reading this book and I was like, damn, maybe I'll be the odd one out. Maybe I'll actually like this because everybody I've seen has hated this book. I might just be the odd one out. No. Anyways, hopefully now we can walk into a better book because I've heard good things about this book in particular and I've read a book by the author before so I have hope that this girly pop will pull through with a good book. That is The Last Housewife by Ashley Winstead. Listen, I just want one five star out of this video. I'm not asking for anything else. It's a well-rounded video. Got one of each from the scale. <laughs> So 
I started The Last Housewife, finished part one, about to walk into part two, currently sprinting with my Patreons, and I thought I'd come on here and update you guys, or I moved on with part two, because I'm currently 177 pages into this. It's quite a lot to read, which is why I'm taking breaks in between, just because of my own mental sanity, because it is quite descriptive. It is quite a thorough with how it sets up the scene and explains things. And I do appreciate to whomever's idea it was that it does have the content warnings right at the start of the book so that the reader can gauge whether or not they want to walk into the book because it is quite heavy. And I am not surprised that it is just based on the setup of the book, which is surrounding cults. However, we follow our main character, Shay, and she loves true crime podcasts, particularly one that is hosted by a once childhood friend named Jamie. Incidentally, as the catalyst of the book, she is one day listening to the podcast and ends up hearing that one of her best friends slash roommates from college has actually passed away. The police rules it as a suicide. However, her and Jamie are not that convinced, even though the police rules it that because they really don't have anything else to lead anywhere else. And so they take it upon themselves to fly to New York and really get to the bottom of this through investigation so that Jamie can utilize that for his podcast and Shay can get the closure that she needs for a person that she very much cared about and has a lot of history with. Now, obviously, going into this book, I knew that it was going to deal with cults, the conversation about cults, how that environment looks like, how it works, exactly who they target. I knew all of those things. However, I thought that all of that was going to happen present time for some reason. Don't ask me why. Pleasantly surprised at the fact that it is all happening through callbacks with Shay detailing all of her past with Laurel in college to Jamie so that he can use that as an interview for the podcast. And that really is where the bulk of the description and the bulk of the trigger elements of the book come in. The book in ways really reminds me of Eyes Wide Shut, the Kubrick movie, which that movie in and of itself was so controversial because of the themes and what it explores and how it is set up visually. And it also has so many conspiracies because at one point in time, people were saying how Kubrick was murdered because of making that movie. Point is, it really does remind me in present time because they incidentally stumble upon a sex cult. It really does remind me of Eyes Wide Shut and how there were men in robes wearing masks, really pushing the narrative that men are superior, really pushing onto the misogyny, onto that patriarchy with women servicing them, and it having like a very specific visual, it really does feel like a callback to that. However, I think what this book does so well is doing that framework of somebody who has been in a cult and really recalling all of that information in present time, in first person, and getting to see it from the perspective of somebody who was involved in it and didn't really know what was happening at the time. Somebody who was groomed and gaslit into to becoming something else to service a man because of his own wicked schemes, his own fucked up thoughts and ideologies and really getting to see past her justify all of those thoughts and even still present her although she is out of that lifestyle, although it is not something that she experiences on the daily anymore, it is still something that lives in the back of her head and so she still finds herself sort of defending or justifying certain things and there are still things that obviously will trigger her into falling onto certain patterns, into certain thoughts or behavioral patterns. It's all very intricate and nuanced, obviously. And so I think what Ashley Winstead, at least in my opinion, as somebody who's never gone through it, but just based on like a human mind perspective, I think it's so interesting and so well laid out and very disturbing to read. And that's just the reality. Like the book is hard to read because of that reason. Gotta stay hydrated, kids. Okay, so hear me out. I finished The Last Housewife, and although this is not like the best book I've ever read, there are still a lot of things that work for this book. However, there were a lot of random, sort of underdeveloped, super campy scenes that I wasn't really a fan of. But the overarching theme of this and the commentary it provides is actually really, really good. I think at the core of this book really is the conversation surrounding female rage and the question of, so many things happen to women on a daily basis and female presenting people constantly being attacked and targeted for being the quote unquote lesser gender. So with that in question, how much more are women supposed to take before they step up to the plate and say it goes no more? We see Shay time and time again be faced with these really difficult situations and with these really disgusting men who really think themselves superior. All of the women in this book are faced with the harsh reality that that is still a set of 
of ideologies that a lot of men and people in general, because there are still women who have internalized misogyny, but a lot of people who hold these sets of beliefs and really challenged as to what are you going to do now that you are faced with this reality. And it goes so much more beyond the cults. Yes, we see the cult aspect of the book, but it bleeds onto everyday life with these men positioning themselves in power to really influence what women can or cannot do, what opportunities they get or they don't get. And it's a really scary reality that I'm sure happens in several places in the world where these cults are specifically made to make women feel inferior and to make sure that they stay inferior. And in this book, it gets really, really wild. And I will say, although most of the book really is good, the elements that were played up, exaggerated, and felt very campy are not my cup of tea. And I think reading this book, I'm starting to realize that when it comes to the cult conversation, when it comes to the cult exploration in media, whether that's books, movies, TV shows, I am really not into it getting too cam. And so that's just personally something that I don't love. So yes, it was good. I I think I'm giving it either a three or a three and a half star. I feel like a three star sounds more right, but I'm a little bit torn because I think the parts that worked for this book worked really, really well. And then the parts that I didn't love really worked to its detriment. So I don't know where I fall, but just know it's either a three or a three and a half. On to the last one. Let's talk about it. I started the push and this is actually really good. I'm really enjoying this. I'm already halfway through. So I'm on page 156, about to start chapter 45 and I am enjoying every single page of this book. I wouldn't necessarily call this a thriller more than I'd say that this is the perfect intersection between literary fiction and then a psychological thriller. It sort of resides right in the middle and it's towing the line so perfectly because the conversation surrounding the uncomfortable bits and the unheard of or untalked about things regarding motherhood is really, really good. I think oftentimes we see obviously stories about motherhood and the scope of what is quote unquote the norm. And we see the mom instantly being incredibly supportive, incredibly protective, super nurturing. And we see this very deep, almost otherworldly connection between the child and the mother. And in this one, that is not what we get to see. We get to see a different side. We get to see this almost strained connection between our newborn child and Blythe, who's our main character where she doesn't really feel this deep connection with the baby. Although the baby grew inside of her and she was very excited at first, she has always felt like something was wrong with her daughter. Whether something is or not wrong, that is something that we don't yet know. This could very well all be in her head and this could not be happening in real time, but it's definitely giving orphan vibes in the sense of not necessarily the scope of the child, but also yes, mostly though through the scope of the mother questioning whether or not her child is a little bit more twisted than meets the eye. And I think having the husband be so enamored with the daughter and just so taken by, you know, what they created together and like raising this kid is obviously adding this element of is Blythe actually seeing these things or like is she tripping? Because she very well could be. I think also the conversation around parenthood in general and how sometimes for some couples having a kid really does put a strain in the relationship is very well put together in this book. It is something that is not as commonly seen, I feel like, at least in literature. The strain in the marriage is typically always due to something else, so I quite like that this book is really exploring things that are not that talked about in media, I feel like, but yet very real life things from like postpartum depression to not being connected to your child to the financial changes that happen with having a kid, how all of that can put a strain into a marriage and can potentially lead to the falling out of love, if you want to call it that, or they're building tension or people discovering that they're more incompatible than they initially thought. I think also the format of the book, it has really short chapters, so it's really working for the book and it not only is short but also some chapters are written in second person and they are addressed to Fox who is the husband which honestly gives Joe Goldberg a run for his money which is quite good and it also raises the question which I am quite enjoying because we get to see the 
these flashbacks with Blythe's mother and her grandmother so we get to see different aspects of motherhood. It raises the question through seeing that if being a quote-unquote bad mother is something that's hereditary and is something that you learn or if it's something that happens depending on the landscape of your life and the situation that you're going through. So it is all very quite interesting and I've never read anything like this so I am very much vibing. I asked for one five-star book in this video and I got it. Listen, you get what you wish for and I definitely got that with the push. I loved this and I think I'm starting to realize that I really love books that are more so focused as character study where we really get to see only one person's perspective but we get to see all of their nuances as an individual and exactly what has led them to be the person that they are at the point that the story starts and ends and this is exactly what this book is. It's essentially a character study on Blythe and the occurrences of her life from getting married and being really hopeful and building a family to then struggling with her marriage and not really connecting with her child and everything that comes with that from the depression to the anxiety to the lies within a marriage to the not being believed when you are saying something that is most likely within the realm of possibility and I thought every second of this not only was it beautifully written but it also was just so captivating and entrancing and I couldn't stop reading this like it really is a one sitting type of book because you just want to know what happens at the end and of what Blythe is saying is right or not and I love that we get the answer but we get the answer on the very very last page at its core it really is a book about motherhood and about grief and the anxieties of being a new mom and feeling like you are never going to live up to the expectation or that you're never going to fit into the mold of what motherhood is supposed to look like and almost feeling inadequate and especially comparing yourself to other women and what that leads to it is honestly a captivating read and i loved every second of it so five stars for it and to wrap it up to nobody's surprise because it really does go along with the ratings i gave everything i think this would be my final ranking for the books that i ended up reading for this video and let me tell you i actually enjoyed every single second of this i love reading thrillers and i feel like i need to read them more often maybe not in bulk like this but most definitely just more sporadically so yes you guys i hope that you enjoyed this video if you did don't forget to give it a massive thumbs up down below and leave me a comment have you read any of these books what have you thought of these books if you have read them or if you have a particular favorite thriller or a disappointing one i think there's a space for both let a girl know down in the comment section and subscribe if you haven't done so already and if you want to support the channel further i do have a patreon it is always linked down below alongside all of my socials i love you guys so so much and i shall see you on the next one bye guys